Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen. Today, we talk to a corporate insider who knows where most of the skeletons are buried in the health insurance industry. He knows because he buried many of them himself. But in May 2008, Wendell Potter, Vice President for Communications at Signet Insurance, walked away from his lucrative job and became the insurance industry's worst nightmare, a whistleblower. Wendell Potter is now a senior analyst at the Center for Public Integrity, a fellow at the Center for Media and Democracy, and the author of Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider, speaks out on how corporate PR is killing health care and deceiving Americans. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you, Mark. What was the trajectory? How did you get from being a journalist to the, uh, and then you went into work in the political campaign, then yeah. you became, so, uh, what is the natural progression there? Well, uh, there is not one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, taking advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. And who you know. Ex who you know, yeah. exactly, yeah. and what opportunities mm -hmm. fall into place uh, at any given time. I don't mm -hmm. think that I would never have, if I were to map my career from mm -hmm. uh, graduation, uh, you and I wouldn't be here now, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it just happened that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, a college classmate of mine at the Baptist uh, uh, tracked me down and told me about a job that was open there, and mm -hmm. uh, so that led to some interviews and a job offer, and and I took the the job as I was actually head of PR and advertising for uh, the Baptist Health System, uh, which was a system of of uh, several hospitals in mm -hmm. in East Tennessee, as well as. Uh, an HMO, a fledgling HMO. It's the first time I'd ever heard of an HMO. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was a PR guy for one. And so from Baptist? From Baptist, uh, again, it's who you know. I was. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I got a call from someone who was a friend of mine uh, mm -hmm. uh, who had uh, gotten a good job at Humana. Humana mm -hmm. is a big for-profit uh, insurance company mm -hmm. now. At that time, this was in 1989, mm -hmm. um, it was uh, uh, a company that also owned a lot of hospitals, and right. I was recruited uh, to really support the hospital side of the mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. It was one of the biggest hospital companies in the world. It had com uh, hospitals abroad, so I and as I recall, not uh, without scandal itself. Oh, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and so, some part of my responsibility was crisis communications, and mm -hmm. uh, I got pretty good at that. If a mm -hmm. if a crisis does develop and it becomes a public crisis or a public scandal of some nature. Uh, you are then shifting into damage control mode. Mm -hmm. And would you be in the know of that information, for instance, when you were at Humana? Uh, it depended. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I, I, I know that I was not told everything, mm -hmm. uh, so there'd be some deniability, I guess. Right. And uh, you would be aware that you weren't being told and that yeah. was good for you. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's part of the deal. Yeah. Uh, you, you wanted to make sure that uh, you had uh, sufficient information to mm -hmm. be able to tell the story as uh, the company wanted it to be told, mm -hmm. but not uh, have so much information that if you were asked a question, uh, you weren't put in a position of lying. Right. Okay, so how long were you at Humana? Four years. Mm -hmm. I was there four years, and while I was there, the company decided to uh, uh, divest or spin off its hospitals and become uh, exclusively a health insurer, a mm -hmm. managed care company. Mm -hmm. uh, the company's board and its investors felt that there was more money to be made in health insurance than operating hospitals, and um, so it decided to go that route. And I was invited to stay on uh, rather than go with the hospitals. I stayed with Humana, the managed care company, and, and became head of corporate communications for Humana. But after doing that for about a, a year, I got another call. We got a call from a recruiter this time to uh, um, who was representing Cigna, and I uh, was uh, enticed to go to a, a bigger, a, even bigger managed care company. I remember uh, at the time I talked to a friend of mine who had who had left Humana sometime previously and had, had gone to Connecticut. And Connecticut, I went. I actually wound up going to Connecticut, where uh, Cigna's healthcare operations were based. <clears throat> and I. Uh, uh, called my friend who had made the, the trip previously and asked him what he thought about it. And he said, come on up. It's like joining the big leagues after Humana and Louisville. But he said, um, uh, know that when you move to New England from Louisville, you might as well be moving, moving to France. And it was pretty much like that, moving to France and moving to the big leagues. Well, we're going to take a, a short break here, a little pause, and come back to the big leagues when we do with more uh, with Wendell Potter and his story. 
We're chatting with Wendell Potter, author of Deadly Spin, his insider's account of self-serving anti-consumer practices of the health insurance industry. Uh, when we left, you were talking about moving uh, north uh, and uh, assuming uh, your uh, position at uh, Cigna Corporation. Tell me about that. Well, I was hired to support uh, uh, the HMOs the company had. At that point, it had not made a full transition to healthcare and not the full trans transition to managed care. And what year are we talking about now? This was 1993. Okay. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I uh, was uh, in Connecticut supporting the healthcare uh, division of the company. Uh, I was there for four years. Initially, uh, when I joined the company, Cigna mm -hmm. was still a multi-line insurance company. It had a property and casualty division, had a financial mm -hmm. services division, uh, a reinsurance division, and some others. But mm -hmm. uh, um, just like Humana, the, the board and, and investors said, you guys need to focus on one or two lines of business. So mm -hmm. over the course of the time that I was there, the company divested uh, mm -hmm. all of those divisions to focus on health care. Once mm -hmm. again, uh, Wall Street felt that more money could be made um, on insurance, health insurance and managed mm -hmm. care plans. So that's where the company uh, was focused. That's why I was hired, was to help uh, uh, the company established more of a reputation as a managed care company and to provide PR support for the individual plans that the company had. It was, uh, it was a big player in managed care, but it wasn't all that well known. So my job was to mm -hmm. help to change that. And so at a certain point in time, you're working at Cigna and you come to a conclusion that uh, I can't do this anymore. Tell me about what led up to your decision uh, to blow the whistle? Well, I was becoming increasingly uncomfortable serving as a spokesman for the industry, really, not, mm -hmm. not necessarily just for Cigna, but mm -hmm. I was becoming more and more aware of the practices that these companies engage in to be able to make sure that they are meeting Wall Street's financial expe ex expectations. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, after spending four years in Connecticut, I was uh, uh, given an opportunity, a promotion, uh, if I, but it would require my moving to Philadelphia, where the mm -hmm. corporate office is and uh, uh, I would become the chief spokesman for the company and the mm -hmm. person who handled financial communications to the media. So I had to know a lot about the company and the industry mm -hmm. and I learned a lot. The higher up the corporate ladder I climbed, the, the more I understood what these companies do mm -hmm. to meet Wall Street's expectations and I was very much aware of the movement or the shift that the companies have been uh, actually forcing all of us into, they've been forcing all of us into uh, these high deductible plans under the uh, euphemistic term uh, consumer directed plans or consumer driven plans. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is, uh, I, I, I was becoming very much aware of, of how these companies um, get rid of risk, mm -hmm. uh, get rid of customers that are sick, uh, avoid paying claims. Now, of course this is contrary to the underlying assumption about insurance or its purpose which is that it's supposed to be a risk pool right. uh, and it's a shared risk. Yeah. But what you're saying essentially is, is that the insurance industry wants the consumers to share all the risk. Well that's right and, yeah. and what you described was the original concept of insurance mm -hmm. and it, it worked. Mm -hmm. But when the profit motive entered uh, health insurance, that's mm -hmm. when things began to change. Mm -hmm. And the big for-profit health insurers wanted to make sure that they were uh, uh, getting rid of or not taking on as much risk as mm -hmm. they, you know, they tried to avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would uh, cherry pick the healthiest and uh, uh, avoid uh, writing or, or selling insurance to people who need it. So I became increasingly aware that um, the health insurance industry was a part of the problem, not mm. really a part of the solution. But Give me a, w when were you feeling this? About what year? This was uh, 2006 and mm. 2007. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2007 was a very important year for me because mm -hmm. I was becoming, uh, like I said, increasingly uncomfortable doing what I was doing. I was becoming yeah. skeptical about what I was uh, trying to make people believe was was really the truth. 
And uh, were you sharing that skepticism internally at all at that point? To a, to a few folks. I yeah. mean, there there, there are mm -hmm. there are people within the industry, people who are still inside these companies mm -hmm. who um, go to work day in and day out, knowing that that uh, they'd rather not be doing what they're doing, but mm -hmm. still, it's yep. a job. It's yep. where they have to be, yep. where they are. Um, so there's a lot of skepticism mm -hmm. inside these companies, and so we would quietly share. Uh, stories with each other and mm -hmm. their concerns, but uh, I'm, I guess I'm one of the few to, to act on that and to leave. It took, um, though, a trip back to Tennessee mm -hmm. for me to really come face to face with what I was doing for a living. What happened? I was visiting my, my, po my folks who mm -hmm. live in Kingsport still. My dad died in, in December, but at this time they were, they were both there and mm -hmm. I uh, picked up the hometown, my hometown newspaper, the one mm -hmm. I'd worked for when I was 17, mm -hmm. and there was a story about something called a healthcare expedition that was being held a few miles up the road, mm -hmm. um, uh, actually across the state line into, into Virginia, the southwestern part mm -hmm. of Virginia. Uh, when I got to the fairgrounds, at the Wise County Fairgrounds, I uh, there was hardly a place to park my car, so I knew there were a lot of folks there. Right. Uh, but it was not until I walked through the gates. I got mm -hmm. there late morning, but by the time mm -hmm. I got there, everybody who was was trying to get in was already inside mm -hmm. uh, the fairground. I couldn't see until I actually walked inside, and, and it was just so stunning. I saw something I would never have expected to see in this country. There were, there were people who were lined up by the hundreds uh, mm -hmm. to get care. And uh, these folks, many of them were soaking wet because it was misty and been raining that morning. And uh, uh, I also became very quickly aware that a lot of these lines uh, led to barns and animal stalls uh, because other volunteers, they come a day or two before to scrub down the barn and mm -hmm. the animal stalls uh, so that uh, these doctors and nurses and other uh, caregivers could treat these folks. Uh, they also, there, you know, there weren't enough barns and animal stalls, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, so they had to set up tents. Uh, it was that big, uh, that big of an event. People drove. I, I, I learned from four and five hundred miles around uh, to come to get care that's being provided free, and and when I saw that, it was just like being hit by lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an epiphany. It mm -hmm. really was an epiphany because I immediately realized that what I was doing for a living was making, I, you know, I had. I had I'm, I was somewhat responsible for the for the fact that they were having to get care that way. These people had jobs, mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not on Medicaid. They were not on Medicare. They weren't eligible for a public plan. Mm -hmm. uh, they had jobs, but they worked for jobs that didn't offer benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, fewer and fewer small employers are able to offer benefits these days. Fewer and fewer people are able to af afford care on what's called the individual market. Uh, and a lot of people couldn't buy coverage at any price because insurance companies, as I said before, they try to avoid risk. So they will blackball people. If you have a, a pre-existing condition, they won't sell you coverage. So these people had no alternative, really, but to wait uh, uh, to get care that way. They, they, they didn't have enough money mm -hmm. to be able to go to the doctor or to, to get medications. Uh, uh, even though they were working, they were, you know, they were low I have people. to ask, I mean, at the time, People would talk about, well, there are 22 million, there are 30 million mm -hmm. uh, uninsured in the country. And when you would hear those numbers, would, what registered for you? That you didn't see your own hometown at the time? No, I didn't. When you uh, just hear numbers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very abstract. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and mm -hmm. I was able to continue doing what I was doing because it was an abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I dealt in numbers all the time. I right. dealt. Uh, in the, the, the millions of, of, of customers that Cigna had or individual members, right. uh, the, the billions of dollars that the company mm -hmm. took in in revenue and, and mm -hmm. made in profits. Uh, so it was as I dealt in numbers largely and I was able to isolate myself mm -hmm. on a daily basis from people who really uh, uh, needed care and needed insurance. It was only, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, I made that decision that morning to drive up there. Mm -hmm. I probably, if I hadn't, might still be there. But uh, uh, when I saw those folks, I, it no longer was an abstraction, could not possibly be, never was ever again after that. Mm -hmm. And so what did you do with that information? Well, I tried to figure out what I was going to do. I, mm -hmm. I, I really honestly made a decision that day mm -hmm. that 
I was not going to be doing what I was doing very much longer. I had to figure this out. Mm -hmm. But I had a family, and yeah. I, it was not something that I could just walk away. F I couldn't walk away from my job. Sure. Uh, obliga obligations, uh, you know, you have to have a mortgage. You've got kids in school. You're paying for their college education and, and all that goes with yeah. maintaining a lifestyle. Uh, and uh, I, uh, it took several months for me to just figure it out. I, I, I don't know that I could have. Uh, mm -hmm. What It became, though, at one point, uh, so much of a crisis of conscience for me that I mm -hmm. finally decided, well, even if I don't have a job to go to, mm -hmm. I can't keep doing this. And that's frankly what I did. I, I left without having another job to go to. And But you did speak out. I did. I, I was reluctant initially. I, 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 uh, so what happened was, was more than, um, you know, I didn't leave just to begin speaking out. Mm -hmm. I know the health insurance industry quite well, not just... Uh, uh, from uh, a one company perspective, but I worked uh, in the industry with my peers at the mm -hmm. trade association level, and I was a, a part of efforts to, uh, over the years, to discredit critics, and mm -hmm. I, I was fully anticipating that if I did start speaking out, that they would come after me in some way. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and that's why I was reluctant. It was a, a year before I actually decided to s that I, I had to speak out. I thought that mm -hmm. there might be a chance that I could work behind the scenes and, and maybe uh, serve as a, an unpaid anonymous consultant to people who were trying to right. change the healthcare system. But uh, You said I've, that uh, part of the industry's MO is to discredit critics. Yeah. You played a role in that yourself, didn't you? I did, and uh, this was just shortly before I'd gone on that, that fateful trip to Wise County, Virginia, about mm -hmm. a month before uh, the movie Sicko premiered. Michael Moore's movie uh, mm -hmm. that uh, was a portrayal of the U.S. healthcare system, and, and really people who have insurance mm -hmm. and thought that they had uh, good coverage and found out uh, when it was too late that mm -hmm. uh, they were really victims themselves, even though they had coverage. Their insurance companies were in control. They were not and were mm -hmm. not providing coverage that their doctors felt they should have. Uh, the insurance industry was afraid of Michael Moore and the impact that that movie might have. So. Um, I was part of an effort, an industry effort, to discredit him, to make people disbelieve Michael Moore, to question his motives, and to... Uh, and, and how did you do that? Well, we hired a big PR firm to start with, a big mm -hmm. Washington-based PR firm, to uh, mount a, a, a campaign to, um, that involved setting up a front group. The front group was called Healthcare America. Um, purported it was, it was supposed to be an organization that uh, people were to believe uh, uh, it was a grassroots organization that was promoting... Uh, AstroTurf. Yeah, it was an AstroTurf, exactly, mm -hmm. uh, AstroTurf uh, organization. Um, if you uh, uh, call the person uh, who was listed as the media uh, uh, contact for the organization, you would have reached a guy at his desk at the PR firm. Uh, and uh, so it didn't exist anything more than name only. Mm -hmm. uh, the PR firm did all the work. The funding came from insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies uh, wanted uh, to discredit Michael Moore as just as much as the insurers did because mm -hmm. they, they didn't like him either. Right. Uh, and uh, so they had quite a bit of money to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, Healthcare America sent out press releases. It uh, took advertisements uh, in papers, particularly around Washington, because a big uh, part of this campaign was to try to uh, dissuade any policymaker from getting too close to Michael Moore. So mm -hmm. uh, the idea was to make him as radioactive as possible. So Do you think it was a successful campaign? To a certain extent, I think yeah. uh, you know the sicko was not nearly as successful mm -hmm. in terms of box office numbers mm -hmm. as uh, Fahrenheit 9/11 was, mm -hmm. or some of his other movies. Uh, a lot of people did see it, yeah. but uh, uh, I think Michael Moore, as a consequence of that campaign, became uh, a figure that was uh, even more, I guess you'd say, polarized uh, mm -hmm. than, than he had been before. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking about another book movie, um, and this is uh, Thank You for Smoking. Mm. And uh, it portrays a situation where there's a kind of a one-upsmanship among corporate uh, PR people in which the more evil the concern or interest that's represented uh, and the more effective you do it, the more successful you are as a corporate PR person. Is, is, that, uh, a, is that pure satire and joke, or is there a reality to that? It's not pure satire. Part of uh, uh, the way you kind of measured your success uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 
and and you didn't see the benevolence of this necessarily mm -hmm. while you were doing it, but mm -hmm. you, um, it, it became kind of a game. You mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that you were uh, having your way with the media, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that you were influencing stories. Uh, and you were you were uh, uh, doing whatever you did. Uh, if it was successful, you would kill a story. You would, uh, uh, and you would d develop relationships with reporters uh, so that they would believe you and trust you, and uh, uh, that's what I became pretty good at. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it wasn't so much that I measured myself on the, the PR successes that were visible, uh, but the, the things that never happened, uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the stories. Stories that, that never appeared. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and, and often and it involved uh, people who were um, uh, denied care. Uh, so, so it's it's not it wasn't just satire. It really mm -hmm. happens. You, 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 you are part of a team, mm -hmm. and and one of the reasons why people stay in those uh, those jobs uh, is because of the corporate culture. You are perceived as a an important part of the of the organization. Uh, you have an important role to play. Uh, you're uh, rewarded if you meet uh, the expectations of your manager and the CEO. Uh, you're rewarded financially. You're rewarded with some internal recognition. Uh, so there, there are a lot of rewards, a lot of reinforcements, and uh, and then and, and you see your peers doing the same kind of thing. So you you you, you have the uh, impression that what you're doing is just fine. It's okay if they're doing it. It must be all right. Mm -hmm. It's part of the game. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about um, quote unquote Obamacare uh, and the industry. Um, efforts to uh, sabotage national health care and your involvement uh, in response to that? Yeah, the, the industry knew that it was likely that there would be a big effort to reform the health care system after the 2008 elections and that there was a good chance they felt that Hillary Clinton would be president to, and, uh, and that was, she was perceived as the, the industry's nemesis. Uh, uh, and, and so the industry began uh, laying plans uh, before I left, long before I left, to try to influence the debate on health care reform and to influence the legislation even as it was being introduced into Congress. And the industry knew that reform probably in some form or fashion was inevitable. In fact, the industry actually needed to have some reform. It, uh, uh, their business models are not ultimately sustainable. You can't keep shifting more and more of the cost to people and expect they're going to continue to buy your products. And you can't ex keep excluding people, and, and, and otherwise your universe of, of potential customers is going to shrink, as it has been. So uh, they wanted to have an individual mandate. They mm -hmm. wanted to have a requirement that we all have to buy insurance from uh, a private insurance company. They didn't like a lot of things that was going to be on the table. They didn't want to have a public option. Mm -hmm. That was much of the debate. They didn't want to have a lot of new regulations or consumer protections, but they had an agenda. And so they wanted, they came uh, to the table, if you will, mm -hmm. saying that this time we want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to work with members of Congress and the administration after the president was, after Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. It was all disingenuous, of course, uh, the, the agenda was to uh, influence the development of the legislation and as it worked its way through Congress to, to take out what they didn't like and to make sure that what they did like stayed in the bill. Why is that disingenuous? Because they had uh, a two-pronged or bifurcated PR campaign, as I mm -hmm. call it. Uh, mm -hmm. One was the charm offensive mm -hmm. in which uh, uh, the head of America's health insurance plans will, will, would be telling the president at his first summit on health care reform, Mr. President, you can count on us to work with you and members of Congress in a good faith way to achieve reform. Behind the scenes, uh, uh, as she was saying that, the, uh, the machine was already in progress to try to shape the, the legislation in ways that would benefit the industry more than individual uh, Americans. So, uh, uh, it was disingenuous in that regard that what she and others were saying uh, would make, uh, hopefully reassure the public and the president and lawmakers that they could be trusted to do the right thing. They were wearing the white hats this time. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, what was going on behind the scenes was the real campaign, the real effort to shape uh, what finally emerged through in, in Congress. All right, I got two more questions for you. One is, uh, what should be done about the healthcare insurance industry and healthcare industry. And the second is, have you personally been targeted by your former industry uh, 
um, in the way that you engaged uh, Michael Moore, for instance? To your first question, I think the industry has to be very, very heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the legislation that was passed does have significant new regulations to consumer protections. The industry is working uh, as we speak uh, to try to uh, get those changed, So, mm -hmm. uh, but we need to, to make sure that what's going on is that effort, but we need to make sure also that they're not changed. Uh, mm -hmm. If the industry is regulated as Congress intended, uh, it'll make a big difference. These companies now have to be much more transparent. They have to disclose a lot more information. Uh, they, they, there, there are uh, restrictions on on how they spend our premium dollars now that never existed before. So there are some good things in this legislation, but they are trying to undo those good things. Um, uh, it, it, my, in my, uh, I guess my ideal world, um, uh, these restrictions will be such that uh, investors will say this is not the best place to earn a buck and that if we do have to have insurance companies competing, that uh, uh, they'll cede the turf to nonprofit uh, insurance companies mm -hmm. uh, so that we can go back to the day uh, before the profit motive really ruined our health care system. Maybe that's uh, wishful thinking and a dream that can't come true, but I think it's conceivable. Uh, how's the industry reacted to me? They, they pretend they don't exist. The thing that I had going for me that mm -hmm. maybe some folks wouldn't have is that I did have an understanding of how the media works. Mm -hmm. And I uh, also uh, had served as a spokesman for these companies for a long time, so they really can't refute what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And what I do say is truth, mm -hmm. uh, and they know that. Mm -hmm. Not one time have they agreed to be on the same program with me, uh, either on TV or the radio or in person. They just will not do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're asked about me, they'll have some fairly benign statement because they know if they, if they get into a conversation about me, uh, they might be required or ask some questions they don't want to answer that I've raised in mm -hmm. what you know what I talk about. So they tried uh, to end the conversation by not engaging in the conversation. Exactly, yeah. and uh, and it, it works to a certain extent for mm -hmm. them, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I keep going, mm -hmm. and I plan to keep going. We appreciate it. Many thanks to Wendell Potter, author of Deadly Spin, for taking us deep inside the spin machine that is the corporate health insurance industry. We're listening and hoping our lawmakers are too. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.